makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lockwood. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. Traders await U.S. inflation data out later today in meetings from major central banks for fresh clues on the chances of interest rate cuts next year. U.K. wage growth slows at the sharpest pace in almost two years, the latest sign that the labor market is cooling in response to a flagging economy. Plus, epic defeat. Google loses an antitrust court fight with Fortnite maker Epic Games that may cost it billions of dollars in revenue and upend the mobile app market. So there's quite a lot going on. Let's first of all look at the European markets map. Now this gives us a good indication of some of the fault lines. I guess there are in the markets. We look at treasuries. We look at currencies. Uh, we also look at UK wage growth slowing. This is another further sign that the economy is cooling. But frankly, if you look at treasuries, they're gaining. The dollar's dropping. If you look at equities, they don't really know what to do ahead of the U.S. CPI data. Again, investors will scrutinize for any clues of the Fed's next move on interest rates. So investors watching the U.S. CPI. PI print due today before the Fed then meets for the last time this year. Let's dive a little deeper into the markets with Aliki Wufiak, Portfolio Manager at Rebecca and Bloomberg's Justina Lee. So thank you both for joining us. Justina, kick us off here on, on what kind of importance CPI data has. I mean, it could really uh, move treasuries and dollar. Yeah, totally. I mean, right now, economists are expecting a slowdown in the year-on-year -year annual inflation rate. And that will be kind of another data point, kind of despite the jobs rate numbers last week, confirming that inflation is indeed slowing. But it's interesting because I think at this point, you know, the bond market has baked in quite a lot of optimism about rate cuts next year. So it's not just about inflation slowing. It's also about, I mean, has the U.S. economy slowed enough to warrant as many rate cuts as markets are currently projecting? Yeah, uh, Aliki, what uh, if you look at, you know, some of the things that you like in general, I know you have an underweight in global equities. Does that depend on, on whether the Fed cuts? Listen, we've seen uh, interest rates, especially in the U.S., move uh, significantly lower. Uh, since the end of October, U.S. rates have moved, uh, the 10-year has moved 70 basis points. So, of course, the discount rate had a positive effect on equities. But uh, more from a technical standpoint as well, uh, what we've seen is a lot of optimism in terms of uh, the equity volatility dropping at a very low levels uh, for 2023 uh, from peaks that were observed uh, also in October. And what that meant is we have entered uh, during uh, the last leg of the year into an environment uh, we, where volatility is more benign. This, of course, has supported systematic strategies and uh, some of the support that we've seen in equity market returns coming, it is coming from this part of the market. However, uh, we've also seen on uh, discretionary positioning quite a bit of optimism there. If we look at the latest surveys, uh, these have pointed out towards a quite bullish sentiment uh, for uh, discretionary investors. Yeah. And of course... But Aliki, uh, yeah, I was going to, to uh, rudely <laughs> jump in because you, don't believe, you think central banks have paused, but you actually don't think that there are any imminent interest rate cuts. Indeed. Uh, so we think that uh, the environment is uh, more tilting towards a pause. Uh, <laughs> we think that a lot of uncertainty uh, also priced in, in terms of uh, the growth outlook for next year. What the market is pricing is a soft landing, uh, and there are question marks whether uh, this uh, indeed is going to materialize. Of course, the rate cuts uh, that uh, we've also seen priced in are uh, around 100 basis points for 2024. Uh, we think that these are overextended and uh, potentially uh, at 4.2 percent. The U.S. 10-year rate is uh, at the lower bound where we don't feel comfortable as well uh, in terms of uh, entering the uh, U.S. duration position at these levels. And Justine, I guess if there are interest rate cuts from the Fed, the million dollar question is, it, is it to track inflation or is it because they're really worried that they're going to see a recession or, or we're already in a recession? Right, exactly. And I think that's going to affect the number of rate cuts next year, right? I mean, it does seem, I guess, pretty clear at this point that inflation is probably on a downtrend. Of course, the question is, are we going to, are we nearing that hump when you're trying to get it to the 2% figure? But I think at this point, like, if there are no more signs of demand itself slowing, as there doesn't seem to be from jobs data last week, 
then chances are that you're not going to get as aggressive easing as is currently kind of priced into money markets. Um, Aliki, when you look at some of the other things that we're watching out for, which is ECB, I know you also look at, you know, the resilience of supply chains. We see a lot of onshoring, some money going into the U.S. Or how are you expecting the U.S. economy to behave longer term? Uh, definitely, this is also uh, something that we are very closely watching because, of course, uh, with the onshoring, you expect some of the production uh, changes uh, to take place uh, in the U.S. and potentially this would be inflationary. Uh, so on one hand, uh, we have inflation coming down. On the other hand, uh, higher production costs uh, potentially are going to lead to a stickier inflation uh, in the U.S. in the coming year. So we wouldn't be surprised if we see uh, inflation uh, moving up in 2024. In terms of what you look at, um, Justina, I know you're, there's a lot of talk about earnings and, you know, the earnings kind of depression that we've seen. Are markets now priced to perfection or is there still, like, you know, apart from central banks, is there anything else that, that will change their behavior in the next 12 months? Yeah, it does feel a little bit like this because one interesting trend in equity markets is that it's kind of really embraced this Goldilocks narrative where you have kind of the rate hike cycle over, but maybe the economy not slowing enough. So one interesting kind of rotation recently is that we've really seen a resurgence in small cap stocks, which kind of have been un, you know, out of favor for a long time now. So I think this is a sign that investors are embracing kind of their risk appetite once more. And then they kind of see these like kind of riskier players also benefiting from the current environment. Aliki, how do you play China? I mean, the most important story of the day when it comes to China is Tom McKenzie sending me a story saying there are now more coffee shops actually in China than there are in the U.S. So that is kind of, you know, pause for thought. But how are you expecting uh, policymakers to behave in China? So we are expe expecting some fiscal stimulus to come out from the current discussions uh, that are uh, taking place uh, in China. Uh, but we don't think that the fiscal stimulus would be uh, uh, substantial. So um, some numbers that uh, have come out there is uh, around 140 billion to support uh, uh, mostly the recovery in the Chinese economy uh, going into 2024. Uh, we think although that the property market uh, is still challenged and will remain challenged uh, for the coming year, uh, as uh, defaults uh, are likely to be, uh, to be the case there. So uh, from the perspective more mm -hmm. of our uh, emerging market equity positioning, we do, however, favor more uh, diversified emerging market equity exposure in our portfolios. And this is uh, actually underpinned by three drivers. Uh, the first one is valuations. Valuations are very cheap, uh, both in China, but also from an overall emerging market equity universe. Uh, we see these are trading now 30% discount to developed markets. And more from a fundamental uh, perspective, earnings uh, for emerging markets are expected to be uh, better for 2024. Uh, projections are uh, for earnings growth around uh, the 20% mark. And uh, finally, I think where we do find uh, most of the value is uh, in countries where uh, policy is easing, as well as we've seen inflation rates coming down. For example, Brazil is uh, one case and where uh, policymakers are uh, cutting rates which should be also supportive of uh, equity returns for the coming year. Yeah, and, and Justina, how do you look at China and the interplay between China, the U.S. and everything else? Yeah, I mean, it does feel a little bit like China has structurally shifted to a different place. I mean, part of it is sort of geopolitical tensions being worse. And I think part of it is a lot of international investors don't even want to think about China anymore. And I think sort of the point that was raised earlier is pretty interesting because currently it does seem like Chinese policymakers are considering more fiscal stimulus. But historically, they've always been kind of slightly more against that. So it'd be interesting to see out of this upcoming policy meeting, like how much have they shifted in terms of that stance? All right. Thank you both for joining us. Aliki Rufiak, their portfolio manager at Rebecco and Bloomberg's Justina Lee. Now, a couple of uh, stocks that we're looking at pre-market. Alphabet, of course, losing this Google Play antitrust fight with Epic Games. Now, this has been in the works for quite some time. You can see uh, pre-market Alphabet shares actually down eight-tenths of eight percent. Then Oracle is reporting some disappointing sales on slowing cloud momentum. And you can see Oracle down eight percent. Coming up, we'll unpack the latest UK jobs data and we'll also tell you what it means for the path to interest rates. So we'll try and make sense of it. This is Bloomberg.
Now, UK wage growth has slowed at its sharpest pace in almost two years, a further sign that the labor market is cooling in response to a flagging economy. Now, average weekly earnings, excluding bonuses, rose 7.3% in the three months to October from a year ago. Now, for more on all of this, let's bring in Anna Andrade from Bloomberg Economics. Anna, great to have you on the program. So there has been a drop in wage growth. Is it enough? Hi, good morning. Um, so yeah, so the good news coming out of today's um, labor market release is that drop in wage growth more focused on the private sector. Uh, we saw it drop to 7.3% from 79 Um, More importantly, on an underlying basis, so if you look at the three-month, three-month annualized, which is kind of the metric that the BOE looks at, you, did, you, you do see private sector wage growth going to 4% from 6%. Now, 4% it's closer to the 3% level that's consistent with the 2% inflation target. So overall, you know, this print kind of, you know, shows significant progress. Now, whether it will be enough, um, I mean, for now, we don't think so, uh, because one, I mean, the level is still high. Two, we'll need to see kind of it, it being maintained. Um, and at the same time, the jobs market, it's still very tight historically and from the BOE's perspective, because the BOE thinks that the unemployment rate is at 4.5%. And right now it's still below that. So it's still adding to inflationary pressures. So, Anna, does this change the forecast on long-term rate cuts? Um, no, no, not right now. I mean, we're still we still think that the BOE will want to see because it's been so data dependent for the past uh, hiking cycle. We still think it will want to see progress on the inflation data, uh, and that in our forecast will kind of only come with the April CPI print. Um, so you know they will only get the April CPI print after the May meeting. So for us, like uh, something like the June meeting and August meetings are the kind of the earliest window for for rate cuts. Though you know this print did suggest that there's a general risk that the disease inflation progress happens more strongly. And that's something that we'll need to, you know, to continue to look at. Thank you, Anna and Andrade there from Bloomberg Economics. Now coming up, the threat of rebellion, a constitutional tug of war and a crunch vote in the House of Commons will bring you the very latest on Rishi Sunak's controversial plan to deport some asylum seekers to Rwanda. That's coming up next. And this is Bloomberg. The conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is The Pulse, and I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the UK Parliament is set to vote over the coming hours on the government's latest plans to, or latest changes to its plan to deport some asylum seekers to Rwanda. Now, some right wing members of the Prime Minister's own Conservative Party say the deportation plan does not go far enough, adding to the risks of a parliamentary rebellion. Now, let's bring in Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. Lizzie, good morning. So, the stakes are very high for the Prime Minister, but would he ever be replaced? before an election. Well, the truth is that even if this vote passes today, he'll only get a reprieve until January the 8th. So that same question will rear its ugly head again. And now Rishi Sunak is saying this vote today isn't a vote of confidence in his leadership. But there are people in his party, Conservative MPs, who say it is in all but name. Because if he can't get through one of his top five priorities to stop the votes of illegal immigrants, then he can't govern effectively. Or at least that's what Keir Starmer, the opposition Labour leader, is going to argue, at least. So if we look at the numbers of whether we can get this passed today, uh, you mentioned the various factions that have been rebelling. The right-wing uh, part, part of the party say that the changes they want are not just tweaks. They are much bigger than that, and that the bill would need to be retracted, amended, and resubmitted. But the good news for Sunak is that the One Nation conference of MPs, the more moderate MPs, they've been told to vote for it. So that's about 100 of them. Yeah. The price of that support, though, is that they don't want any more tweaks to the bill to the tough side. So we'll have to see how all the negotiations have been going when we get the vote. Yeah. But there have been lots and lots of MPs going in and out of Downing Street this morning for breakfast. And Kitty Donaldson, our UK political 
political editor tells me that smoked salmon's on the menu. So very la Labour's Keir Starmer. Um, when you look at the, you know, the possible election coming up in the next 15 months, d does it make a difference? Like, what do people, what will they vote on? So if he does get the Rwanda bill through, does it give him more of a chance to get up in the polls? Certainly the right wing of the party thinks so. It's this argument that if you can't get through one of your top priorities, then how can you claim to be this prime minister who is effective? And that's the argument that they're making. It doesn't, they don't seem to care about the consequence of potentially gambling on whether there should be another leadership election before uh, 2025, January 2025, the last date when they have to call this election. But uh, the right wing, the more moderate wing of the party, uh, trying to show stability, focus on the economy, uh, it seems to be a difficult argument for Rishi Sunak to make at the moment. So, Lizzie, when you look at the next six months, are there any, we don't know whether the election will be called in spring, we actually have no idea when he'll call it, whether it's an autumn and there's pros and cons for both of them. Are there specific things that Labour's looking at to, to make sure that they consolidate that 20 poll lead? Well, at the moment, it's really difficult, isn't it, whenever you speak to a Labour minister to get more details out of them about what exactly they want to do. But you can completely see the strategy here. If they commit to anything fiscally and the headroom situation changes, then they're going to be in a bind. But you can kind of see how they're already in a bind here because they've made the front benches plenty of spending commitments but at the same time they don't want to reverse the tax cuts that Jeremy Hunt announced in his autumn statement they don't want to be the party of tax rises but they also don't want to have to borrow more than they've already said that they would because you've seen what happened in the markets to Liz Truss's unfunded tax cuts so this is the point that the Conservatives are going to be making about Labour in the run-up to the election but this is the beauty of being in opposition you don't really have to give away the details until the manifesto time yeah, as long as you hold on to that lead. Thank you, uh, Lizzie Burden, there, our UK correspondent. Now, immigration reform is also a political headache for the French President Emmanuel Macron. Lawmakers have rejected his plan to overhaul immigration, a key part of his campaign agenda in 2022. It's a blow to the President's reform agenda that underscores his inability to build coalitions to pass key legislation. So let's go over to Bloomberg's Caroline Conant in Paris. Caroline, like Sunak here in London, the issues, of course, putting major pressure on on Macron. So how significant is this defeat? Francine, it is actually the first time that the lack of majority in Parliament for Emmanuel Macron translates into a law being rejected even before being debated, even before reaching the floor of the National uh, Assembly. Every uh, time before, even with the controversial pension reform earlier this year, they managed somehow to force it through. Not this time. They tried to please everyone with this immigration bill and in the end they pleased no one among the opposition. Uh, the bill included some measures to facilitate the expulsion of migrants, but at the same time uh, to make it easier for some illegal workers to get their legal status when they work in uh, sectors where you have labor shortages such as construction sector, domestic staff or restaurants and hotels. That was a red line for the Republican opposition. That's something they were totally against. So what's next for Macron and this immigration bill? Uh, the interior minister Gérald Darmanin handed over his resignation last night, something that was refused by Emmanuel Macron, so he remains in place. He's going to have to make some new proposals over the next few days. One way would be to call early elections, but that is unlikely uh, for Emmanuel Macron that this will lead to a bigger majority. Another uh, way would, of course, to uh, please the uh, would be to please the Republicans with some even tougher measures against immigration, like restricting access to health care for some of these illegal uh, migrants. And finally, uh, one of the last resorts would be to call a referendum in spring of 2024, specifically on this immigration uh, bill. But again, that is a very risky political move for Emmanuel Macron. Caroline, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Caroline Conan there in Paris. Now, to China, and China has the most branded coffee shops globally. It's overtaken the U.S. after a 58% boom over the last year. Now, China has nearly 50,000 outlets, according to a report from the World Coffee Portal. There you go. Growth was fueled by delivery-focused chains, Luckin Coffee and Cotty Coffee. Together, they added more than 11,000 new stores. And a brewery is opening its doors in Abu Dhabi this month, becoming the first company to 
to legally make alcohol in the region. Now, the restaurant and pub called Craft by Side Hustle was granted a license to sell beer on tap that's been brewed on premises. It's the latest in a series of moves loosening socially conservative laws in the UAE and the surrounding Gulf region. Coming up with less than 24 hours until COP ends, the clock is ticking for negotiators to agree on a draft climate deal on fossil fuels. So we'll have a full roundup of negotiations next. This is Bloomberg. Now, traders await U.S. inflation data out later today and meetings from major central banks for fresh clues on the chances of interest rate cuts next year. U.K. wage growth slows at the sharpest pace in almost two years, the latest sign that the labor market is cooling in response to a flagging economy. Plus, epic defeat. Google loses an antitrust court fight with Fortnite maker Epic Games that may cost it billions of dollars in revenue and upend the mobile app market. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the clock is ticking down for COP negotiators who are examining a draft of climate deals to cut fossil fuel use and production to get close to net zero by 2050. The former U.S. vice president and climate advocate Al Gore has slammed the draft text, saying it reads as if OPEC dictated word by word. Let's get more now from Bloomberg's Jess Shankleman in Dubai, who's holding the fort and just really looks at this blow by blow to see what's in the final uh, communique. So, Jess, good morning. Thank you so much for doing Oman's work there on the ground. What has the response been to the draft deal so far? Well, Francine, this absolutely by no means is not the final communique. The presidency has just told us in the last hour that they are planning to produce a new text today because the last text that was produced last night was by no means uh, satisfying any country, particularly um, blocks such as the EU, the UK, uh, small island nations that want to see a phase out of fossil fuels um, that is going to be starting by the 2030s. Uh, the text that came last night just merely offered an option for countries to possibly reduce their use of fossil fuels and consumption of fossil fuels. But so, Jess, what are the chances of Saudi Arabia and other major oil producers actually agreeing to the deal? Um, <laughs> Francine, I'm not sure if anyone is going to agree to the deal right now. I think there's a real chance that these talks could end in collapse in the way that Copenhagen did in 2019 or in Madrid in, in sorry, Copenhagen 2009 and Madrid in 2019. I was just talking to Alder Meyer uh, at, he's a, a think tank E3G. He's been to 27 of these 28 COPs, so I, I consider him a veteran of, of this and asking him, is there a way forward? Is there a path to uh, a deal on this? He said the strategy could be to try and ask, isolate the Saudis, um, make, uh, making, trying to get a, 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 to a point where they have to agree to language on a face down. But at the moment, we're nowhere near that. We've counted 18 countries um, that are opposed to that. Nigeria's environment minister just said uh, this morning to my colleague, L Lara Milan, that, he, that fossil fuels are the lifeblood of their economy and they cannot agree to any text that would agree to face down what is keeping them alive. So, Jess, if the deal is agreed in its current form, which seems very, very unlikely, then what happens next? Like, if it doesn't get agreed, then what happens next? Is there a way of making up for these emissions with something else? Um, so the deal won't be agreed in its current form. I think there's enough countries that have said they would walk out of the talks as, as it stands. It would be too weak. So traditionally, the, uh, the talks, the, these, this kind of multilateral process has been criticised because what happens is you uh, get a lowest common denominator result. So the country that wants the least, in this case the fossil fuel producing nations, uh, get what they want. But what we're seeing now is a real pushback from even the, you know, the US, the EU want at least the language that we had in the Paris text, which we don't have right now. Jess, thank you so much. Jess Shankleman there with the very latest from COP28 in Dubai. Now, Britain's competition regulator says it's examining claims by the UK arm of Unilever about how green its products are. Now, let's get more from Bloomberg's Dasha Afa Nisava. Dasha, as always, thank you so much for joining. I mean, we're talking greenwashing. This is like a pretty, you know, big accusation if it's true. So what sort of green claims has Unilever actually been making? 
Hi. So we don't, the CMA hasn't actually pinpointed the exact claims it might have a problem with, but I had a quick look this morning, and SIF, for example, says um, the packaging is made from recycled plastic, and then you look lower down in the footnotes, and it actually says 50% recycled plastic, but we're working towards 100%. So it's that sort of thing. It's the sort of thing that helps Unilever differentiate its products and possibly even charge more for them. So it, this feels like a very big deal for Unilever. It's a big deal for Unilever uh, in particular because uh, for, for at least two CEO time spans, it's touted its purpose, its green credentials. The new CEO, Heinz Schumacher, has kind of moved away slightly from purpose and said that not every product needs to have a social purpose, but still being agenda setting on its green targets and environmental goals has been a, set, a core of its reputation. That, I mean, I guess the concern is that we don't really have proper regulation to tell us what's green, what's not. So, do, I mean, if they were, um, I guess, found guilty of greenwashing, who's it up to to find them? I mean, do they get a fine, or is it just more of an impact on consumers saying, "Well, they're they're lying"? Uh, well, they 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 could get taken to court, and generally, they'd have to, if they were found to be greenwashing, they'd have to commit uh, to a different. A, you know, different course of action, a set of undertakings. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out that the EU has also, is also looking at greenwashing legislation. So this is likely to affect not just Unilever, and not just in, in the UK, but all consumer goods groups across the region. So what does it mean for competitors? We don't, I mean, at this point, we don't actually know if they've done anything wrong. We don't know if they've done anything wrong, and Unilever denies that it has and says that it's surprised and disappointed. Um, but consumer goods companies across Europe are being scrutinised for this uh, more heavily, particularly the claims of recyclability and whether uh, contents is recycled already. Dasha, thank you so much. Great update there from Dasha Afa Nizava with the very latest on Unilever. Coming up, Robin Guru, the first female chief executive of Man Group's 240-year history, tells us how the world's largest publicly traded hedge fund is navigating risk and higher rates. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Well, Europe's banks are set to enter next year with only slightly diminished capital cushions. Well, this suggests that you can keep up the recent payout bonanza despite regulators ordering higher reserves. Now, for more on all this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Nick Comfort in Frankfurt. Nick, good morning. So why were the buffers so strong? Well, it's really down to, to higher interest rates. Uh, banks are, are earning, uh, minting money at the moment because of the, they haven't had to pass on much of the the, 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 the cost of interest rates to, to depositors by, by giving them more interest. In the meantime, they're pocketing much of the profit. And so it's been a, a great year for European banks in terms of earnings. They've managed to set aside money, uh, putting in their capital buffers, and uh, it looks like they will be able to pay out a lot of that to shareholders next year as, as, as dividends and also potentially also share buybacks. So w will the benefits of higher rates actually dissipate for banks? Yes, that's what's, what's expected. We are probably going to see banks have to pass on more of the, of the benefit in terms of, of paying more money on, on uh, deposits. So there might be a bit of competition heating up for deposits, uh, but also, uh, yeah, depositors will be, will be leaving, looking at shopping around for better deals if they don't get more interest from their banks. There's also the question of, uh, um, yeah, exactly, just, just how long that can play out, whether banks can counteract that and whether they can, they can build up... Uh, other streams of revenue at the same time, but the party does look like uh, it's uh, um, going to be slowing down at least next year. So, uh, Nick, there's always, of course, a dark side of higher rates, which is companies to which banks, you know, provide finance to going bust. Is there anything else that we should worry about? Yes, exactly. That's the big question. What do higher rates mean as they filter through to companies and, I mean, also, also borrowers in general having to refinance at higher rates? Will they be able to afford those, those higher, that higher interest burden which they'll be facing? I mean, as one analyst put it recently, I mean, if you, if you look, this has to be one of the best telegraphed uh, potential downturns or recessions of all time. We've been speaking about it for so long. The regulators have been putting banks under pressure. 
So um, while, yes, there could be a spike in, in bad loans, you'd have to be a pretty dumb risk manager not to have had this on your agenda for the coming year. Nick, thanks so much. Nick Comfort there in Frankfurt with the very latest. Now, oil has edged higher after an attack on a tanker in the Red Sea. The incident has raised fears of disruptions to shipping due to the Israel-Hamas war. The U.S. military says the vessel was struck by a missile from Houthi-controlled territory in Yemen. And President Biden has cautioned that U.S. public opinion in support of Israel in its war against Hamas could shift. That's as he seeks to balance his support for the country with limiting civilian casualties in Gaza. Now the remark comes as the White House pushes Congress for a new Israel aid package. And geopolitical risk from the Middle East to Russia is putting increasing pressure on business leaders across the globe. It's a topic I discussed with Robin Grew, the chief executive of the world's biggest publicly traded hedge fund, Man Group. Now she told me the uncertainty is making it more difficult to get a hand on what comes next. Yes, that would be the shortest answer I could ever give. Yes, it is difficult. I think that if this year has taught us anything, it's that prediction is not our strongest suit, perhaps. Um, and that isn't just in relation to markets, it's in relation to these big geopolitical events that we are still living with. But it's quite incredible to, to think that we're in a, in a better place and we thought, I feel like every six months, there's like the doom and gloom crew saying, this, you know, this is it, interest rates have gone too much, we need to reevaluate what happens next. And yet, the economy holds yeah, look at the US numbers, the job numbers. I mean, um, it's been the story of this year is, what, really? They're up again. Um, I, I think that's right, but you're also, we are starting to see some dovish central bank messaging. But I think what's interesting is, I, I am not a believer that necessarily we're gonna see the number of cuts that are currently forecast by the economists of the world coming through 2024. I, th I think when we talk about it, and when I talk about it, and we have this conversation about higher for longer, which I still say out loud, and then cross my fingers in some ways that I, I, there's maybe I'm gonna be entirely wrong, but higher for longer. I think where the nuance is in that message is that what we're unlikely to see is 0%. We're probably unlikely to see 2%. We may see some 50 basis points adjustments, for sure. But I think what we have been signaled clearly from central banks is that they're not frightened of using policy to control inflation or to try and, uh, try and respond to inflation. And I think that's the messaging we should all kind of get used to. Last 10 years, 0% free money. Next 10 years, higher for longer, with that slight nuance in the way that I describe. But Robin, why do you feel, I mean, central banks are really at pains at r reminding us that every couple of weeks, and I wonder whether it's, you know, the cost of money changes everything. Yes. And, and markets, hedge funds, investors don't, haven't quite grappled with that. I think that where they're grappling with it or what they're challenged with, and it's the conversation I'm having with clients, is the what do we do now? How do we think about our portfolio construction? If we think asset holders did very well in the last 10 years, beta was good, um, private equity might have been more interesting, cost of money changes that, um, changes it in any way for multiples for companies, hence the beta argument being tricky, the private equity markets being tricky, because guess what, cost of money and leverage. So what clients are talking to us about and it is, is that portfolio construction piece. What do we do differently to navigate the markets that we are expecting to see or that we are seeing? How do we, how do, we do with that? And that isn't just a beta story, isn't just a passive story, isn't just a private equity story. There's this bit in between about active management and how do they put that into their portfolio? How do they make that work? Robin Grew also gave me her insights on central banks, inflation, how the firm is really moving forward on the consolidation and acquisitions front. We have always said that we will grow the firm organically and we will always look for acquisitions to increase our capability on content for clients. I think what's interesting, as we just did, we completed our acquisition in Q3 of this year with a private credit manager in the US in the middle markets. Um, I think what's interesting is that the multiples look more interesting. I think we've been talking about consolidation, mind. We have been talking about consolidation 
for, since the for GFC. A long time. Since the GFC. I mean, I'm, this is I, this is one of those points I'm gonna I'm gonna perhaps, perhaps want to laugh about in a few years' time from now. But I actually think as we look at the barriers to entry in this space, if we look about the cost of running our businesses, if we think about the scale that we need to operate at, I think, and the multiples that we're starting to see coming down, I think this could be an interesting time for consolidation. But why has it been a long time coming? Is it regulation or there was just no appetite or it I just think, wasn't I think, ripe? I think when, when cash is free, it softens that. I think the the moment where people need to deploy at scale in liquid markets has been something that's softened. If you look at the trends, trend has been in passive, it's been in private equity. If you think about the number of assets that no longer sit in the public domain, that's been our themes over the, next, the last 10 years. Um, I think when private equity doesn't have quite as much cash, when that raising is harder, when lending is harder, these opportunities for niche spaces and expertise to come about, and they want scale. They, they need to be able to operate at scale, and having an organization that can deliver the amount of scale we've put in play, the bit that perhaps is less less sexy and exciting, but that infrastructure, the ability to take businesses and grow them, that's what we do. Well, that's Robin Grew, Chief Executive of the Investment Management Firm Man Group, speaking to me for an upcoming episode of Leaders with LACWA. Now, coming up, Google loses an epic ruling in a suit brought by the makers of video game Fortnite. We'll discuss what it means for the future of the $200 billion app store market. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, Citi's Institutional Clients Group chairman says the environment for M&A should start to get better in 2024 after a very muted year. Leon Calvaria told us about the state of investor appetite for deals. Take a listen. The investor appetite is there, absolutely. They want to see the strategic rationale. They want to understand the time frame to close from a regulatory standpoint, because obviously if it takes two years, they have to factor that in from a present value standpoint. And then they want to see what the value enhancement is. So the investor reaction, I think, will continue to be something that everyone focuses in on. But so far, strategic transactions have done fine. And the issue has simply been long-term regulatory impact and how long will it take and what will be the legal issues to get from here to there. That's what about, unchanged. What about industry here? Because the other big uh, elephant in the room we have not talked about is Occidental Crown Rock, $10.8 billion deal. You're starting to watch mega deals back in the market. Two of the top three deals this year so far have been mega deals in the energy industry. Correct. Is that what's going to drive M&A into 2024? Well, I think the environment for M&A should start to get better here. We've obviously had a very muted year. It's been muted because of the uncertainty on the economy, uncertainty on interest rates, and uncertainty from a regulatory standpoint. Those hurdles are starting to go away. But, you know, you still have a 10-year that has not yet gone down. It's not broken 4%. So financing remains somewhat expensive if people have to do it. But on the other hand, the equity markets, from my standpoint, are at highs. So the use of equity becomes very, very attractive. So I think you will see some more transactions that are large. There is no doubt that those discussions are taking place right now. And I think the boardrooms and chief executives are feeling more comfortable about an economic outlook and a pricing that they can effectively act on. So I think next year should be reasonable. And the other side of it will obviously be an IPO market whose opening, I think, continues to get delayed. That was Citi's Institutional Clients Group Chairman Leon Calvario speaking to Shanali Bazak. Now, Google down in pre-market trading. That's as it suffered legal defeat at the hands of Fortnite maker Epic Games. That threatens to break up an app store duopoly with Apple that generates close to $200 billion a year. Now, the ruling handed down by a San Francisco jury on Monday is a blow to the two companies' business models and could lead to the relaxation of app store rules. Now, to dive deeper into this, let's bring Bloomberg's tech reporter, Mark Bergen. Mark, all right, let's speak in plain English. I mean, is this a disaster for, for Google and for users? 
Um, I don't know. I wouldn't say it's a disaster for Google. Certainly an unexpected blow. Uh, like yeah. they're, they're challenging this, right? Like this is the model that has worked for them for over a decade, right? They provide... Uh, the Android tools largely for free. That's given them, you know, 85% of, of the smartphone world. And in exchange, every time an app, um, you know, makes a, a single dollar uh, on, on through the App Store, uh, Google takes a 30% cut. You know, they've lowered that cut after some pressure to like 15 for certain companies. We've been seeing this for years in countries like like South Korea. They've actually changed that and and added things like outside billing options. But this is the first time that you know Fortnite has the the CEO Tim Sweeney has said. I want the victory is not the court case here. The victory is, is Google changing its business model. So what does that mean for all app developers? And what does it actually mean for Google? I, mean, I was surprised. If you look at pre-market, Google's down like 1%. So were they expecting it or does it not really, you know, hit their business model? Uh, so, you know, there was a $200 billion figure. A bulk of that is Apple. Like a Apple is the premium smartphone King. It makes most of, most of the money in the App Store world. You know, Google has bigger penetration in markets like like India and Indonesia, places where there's uh, a wider distribution of users, but but just a lot, lot less money being exchanged. And so, and, and for Google, this is a this is a smaller part of their business in some ways, right? They don't even disclose the Play Store as a revenue, right? They're counting on search ads, like counting on YouTube and, and cloud. Uh, so my guess, you know, with uh, Shareholders of Alphabet and Google have seen this for a long time, right? When the yep. when the EU brought its big charges years ago, that's a five billion dollar fine, uh, barely a blip, right? Uh, so Google is is able to sort of keep steering its its, its ship through these problems. Uh, Mark, I saw Oracle was down like eight point nine percent, almost nine percent. What are you mostly focused on? Like, what will twenty twenty four bring for a lot of these companies? Uh, I mean, we're still looking at right. You know, regulation is a big question right yeah. now. Google has a, a much bigger regulatory hurdle right there facing this, this Department of Justice case. Uh, the EU just ruled over the weekend on the AI, landmark AI Act. Uh, we're going to see kind of how that's actually being implemented. Um, I think you know, Google is paying a lot of attention to to AI, obviously, and its competition with with, uh, with OpenAI and Microsoft. Um, so I think it, it will the European Union be the, the first among many nation states and geographies to legislate AI? I think that's the, the bigger question we're looking for. Mark, thank you so much. Mark Bergen there, Bloomberg's tech reporter. Now, we'll do, of course, a full-time analysis of the CPI data from the U.S. This is what uh, asset classes are doing right now. We'll look at treasuries, the FTSE gaining some 0.7%. Now, up next, Bloomberg Brief. Danny Berger in London, the man is crying in New York, and this is Bloomberg. Thank you.